Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about extractions in oral surgery. I'm going to talk about what are the facts in extraction and then what are the indications for extractions, what are the contraindications and what is the classification, different classifications of impacted tooth. I'm also going to talk about um, complications what can go wrong during extraction procedure, like what is subperiosteal abscess, what are different oroantral communication and nerve injuries and so on. So let's begin. So first coming to indications for extractions. First indication is severe caries where teeth cannot be restored. Next is pulpal necrosis and irreversible pulpitis when endo is not an option. And when there is severe periodontal disease where there is irreversible bone loss and tooth mobility. So imagine a situation where there is, you know, grade three mobility. I'm just explaining a situation. There is grade three mobility in low incisors. Of course, you would want to uh, extract it because it's, um, it's a very severe condition. Now coming to orthodontic prescriptions. So what happens in this scenario is suppose I'll give you an example in one of the patients that I've come across. So this patient was going for an ortho treatment and um, her lower arch was fine, but then they had to extract upper arch maxillary first molars, premolars, okay? So then they were able to correct the class two situation. So usually it is maxillary first premolars, then next is mandibular first premolars and also third molars. But most of the cases that you come across will be usually maxillary first premolars and mandibular first premolars, depending on what type of malocclusion it is. Now coming to malpose teeth. Teeth that can cause mucosal trauma and cannot be repositioned with orthodontics. Teeth in hyperocclusion that are unopposed and interfering with other restorative care. Now, if there is cracked teeth, it is an indication for extraction. Now, pre-prosthetic extraction. Suppose the patient has planned to go for a complete denture and then there are like little... Um, tooth remaining, like what do I mean is there might be root stumps or there might be like a few teeth. So you have to extract it in order to continue with the procedure for CD. Now impacted tooth, that tooth that do not erupt into a proper occlusion and mostly it is maxillary and mandibular third molars or wisdom teeth. Supernumerary teeth is also an indication for extraction and teeth associated with pathology. Now, Patients needing radiation therapy for head and neck cancer should be evaluated for the health of dentition because these patients, whatever tooth you know has to be extracted, has to be extracted before uh, the radiation therapy because or else these patients might suffer with bronze condition and. Um, this is osteoradio necrosis because of dysphosphonates and radiation, which I'll be talking in my next class. Now coming to surgical extractions and impactions. Impaction means the tooth does not erupt into the dental arch within the expected time. The tooth becomes impacted because adjacent teeth and then there is dense overlying bone or excessive soft tissue, like suppose this is the third molar. There might be soft tissue covering it, okay? In this case, it would be easy to extract by just removing the soft tissue. Or there might be overlying bone, then bone drilling might have to be done. Those all are the situations where the tooth might be impacted. Because impacted tooth do not erupt, they are retained for the patient's lifetime unless surgically removed. So they have to be surgically removed or else it remains for lifetime. The most commonly impacted teeth are mandibular third molars. This is very, very, very important. Please remember this. First is mandibular third molars. Next is maxillary third molars and maxillary canines. So it is mandibular third molars. Then the maxillary third molars and the canines, maxillary canines. 
okay? The term unerupted includes both impacted teeth and the teeth that are in process of erupting. So unerupted includes two terms, okay? Let me change the color so that it will be easy for you guys to distinguish. Unerupted means it can include impacted teeth as well as the teeth that are in the process of erupting but have not yet erupted. The term embedded is occasionally used interchangeably with the term impacted. So impacted can be used and also embedded term also can be used. Inadequate arch length is the primary reason that teeth fail to erupt. The most common teeth to become impacted are third molars because they are the last to erupt. Okay. So the most common teeth to become impacted are the third molars. Third molars are the last two to erupt. Most common congenital missing tooth are third molars, lateral incisors, and mandibular premolars. So what are the most common congenital missing tooth? Third molars and the lateral incisors and mandibular premolars. I have included most common impacted teeth as well as missing teeth in the same page so that you remember. Impacted teeth, I told you first is mandibular third molar, then comes maxillary third molar, then comes maxillary canines. Whereas congenitally missing includes third molars and lateral incisors and mandibular premolars. So congenital missing can be both maxillary or mandibular third molars, lateral incisors, as well as mandibular premolars. Now coming to classification of impacted tooth. So Impacted tooth are classified based on three types. Now, the first one is nature of overlying tissue. Okay, so this is the first basis of classification that is based on nature of overlying tissue. Now, this is soft tissue impaction. Okay, here you can see there is soft tissue covering a part of the tooth, right? So, if you want to extract this tooth just by taking the soft tissue off, you can easily extract the tooth. Right, the height of the contour is above the bone level and gingiva is completely or partially, it is partially covered in this situation. So I'll just write down the points for you over here. So height of contour is above the bone level. Okay. And gingiva is completely or partially covering tooth, okay? Now, this is easiest for extraction, okay? Now coming to partial bony impaction and complete bony impaction. So next, let me explain you something. This partial bony impaction and the complete bony impaction comes under heart tissue impactions, okay? Whereas the soft tissue impaction is soft tissue impaction. Now, in the heart tissue impaction, we have partial and we have complete, okay? In the partial, the height of the contour is below the bone level. It is below the bone level. Height of contour is below the bone level. Whereas in complete, what happens here is it is completely, the tooth is completely, uh, completely impacted, right? Now, what do, does that mean is the tooth is entirely encapsulated within the bone tooth is entirely encapsulated within the bone. Okay, so this is about the first type of classification that is based on the nature of the overlying tissue. We have two types of impactions. One is soft tissue impaction and next is hard tissue impaction. Coming to soft tissue impaction, what happens? Height of the contour is above the bone levels and gingiva is completely or partially covering the tooth. 
Now coming to heart tissue impactions, we are having two types. One is partial and complete. In the partial, the height of the contour is below the bone level, whereas in complete, the tooth is entirely encapsulated within the bone. So this is hardest to extract because it's completely below the bone. You don't know which nerve structure it might damage. It might damage inferior alveolar nerve. It might damage the lingual nerve. Or if you use excess force, you might even fracture the buccal cortex. So there are many complications. So you have to do that very carefully. Now coming to Winters classification and Bell and Gregory classification. So first we are going to talk about Winters classification. This is Winters classification. And this is Bell and Gregory classification. Okay. Now, Winters classification, most main important thing you have to remember is it is mainly for lower molars. Okay. And how is this classified is based on the position of the long axis of the third molar in relation to the long axis of the second molar. That is how this has been classified. Now, first we will study about vertical. Here, the long axis of the third molar and second molar are parallel to each other, right? So they are parallel to each other. In the mesioangular, third molar is tipped little mesially, okay, in relation to the second molar. So here, what is happening? Third molar is tipped little mesially. So here we are, what are we doing? We are comparing third molar long axis with that of the second molar. Okay, that is what we are doing. Now coming to horizontal, the long axis of the second molar and third molar are perpendicular to each other. So it is perpendicular. Okay, so the second molar is perpendicular to the long axis of the third molar. All right, now coming to distoangular. Okay, distoangular is third molar is, is tipped distally. Okay, buccolingual is crown is facing, like to imagine if you face towards the way you're watching right now, like it can be towards the laptop screen or away from the screen. Okay, others can be any way, other way around or inverted. Okay, so this is, comes under others. Now, now, which one is easiest to extract in this and most difficult? So easiest to extract will be mesioangular and difficult to extract will be distoangular because mesioangular is easy as compared to distoangular because in distoangular what happens is here you can see like this. I don't think what is the difference? Like, why do you think this triangular is more difficult? Because what happens over here is when you try to extract the third molar, you have to make sure that you are not damaging the bone. And then there is dense bone in order for you to reach. You have to get rid of the bone and then reach and extract. And also make sure that you know you're not damaging any structures. So therefore, distoangular is the most difficult one, and mesioangular is easiest one. Okay, so that was about Winters classification. I hope you all have understood. Now coming to Pell and Gregory classification. So this is Pell and Gregory classification. So what happens is Pell and Gregory classification is of two types. Okay, one is it is divided into class one, class two, class three, based on the Ramus relationship. And next we have level A, B, and C based on the impaction depth. Okay, so we have two things. One is based on Ramus relationship and another one is based on the impaction depth. So class one. So it depends on like how far does the tooth go inside the ramus. Okay. 
so third molar here here third molar is anterior to the ramus like you can see here this is half is embedded this is completely it's embedded so here it will be easy to pull here it will be little difficult here it is very difficult because you know it's already inside so you have to remove the above structures and then like it's a little more complicated so here half is embedded and here completely it is embedded okay now coming to level a b and c level a is what happens is here you can see this is also similar only a is at the same plane as other molars this tooth is in same plane as other molars right this one is little below and c is completely below so of course here also c is very hard right so this is based on the classification of impaction depth a b c and ramus is 1 2 and 3 okay so i hope it's clear based on the nature of the overlying tissue it is classified into two types one is soft tissue impaction and another one is hard tissue impaction soft tissue impaction the height of the contour is above the bone level gingiva is completely or partially covering it here it's partially covering it so once you get rid of this the tooth will be easily able to be you know it's easy to extract it now coming to hard tissue impaction it is of two types one is partial and complete what happens in partial is the height of contour is below the bone level and here it is completely encapsulated within the bone and this is very difficult to extract now winter's classification is mainly based on third molar's long axis in relationship with that of the second molar in vertical the relationship is parallel in mesio angular third molar is tilted mesially this is easiest to extract horizontal where the second molar is perpendicular to the third molar distal angular is very difficult buccal lingual is the crown is facing buccal direction or lingual direction and inverted is other way around now coming to pell and gregory classification it is classified on in two types one is based on the ramus relationship and another one is based on the impaction depth now ramus relationship is class 1 class 2 class 3 class 1 what happens see here third molar is anterior to the ramus and here half is embedded and here it's completely embedded a b and c they are divided based on the impaction depth see the all the molars are in the same plane here third molar is little down and here it is very deep so this is difficult to extract and even this is difficult to extract so now coming to the classifications of impacted teeth this is the ones which i explained earlier so this is just if anyone wants to take the screenshot they can take it so now coming to the surgical principles so exposure whether removing third molars or other difficult extractions there are several important principles for surgical extraction the first is surgeon must have adequate visibility of the surgical site so suppose you are extracting maxillary third molar okay you have to make sure that there is enough visibility and then there must be exposure with adequateized flap so whenever uh, envelope flap is used you have to make sure that you know the flap is adequate like there should be good amount of um, blood supply so that it will heal well later envelope flaps are mostly used but releasing incisions are also common now coming to bone removal removal of bone is often needed for atraumatic extractions okay i've seen a case where you know it was a difficult case of uh, extraction of impacted um, mandibular third molar because the patient was complaining of crowding and not just that and it was like um, it needed the removal of bone was needed and that was better because you know when you drill the bone with the help of a surgical bar that is more better because you drill it and then like you take out the third molar in pieces rather than fracture the entire buccal cortex because it, you you'll be using very much force and if it's mandibular of course you are tend to use more force so you have to be very careful when you remove the tooth 
Okay, this is just an um, envelope flap and a triangular flap. We'll be talking about flaps when we discuss the flap topic. So I'm just giving you an overview. Tooth sectioning, like I have mentioned in the case I have seen, the tooth was broken into two sections. So sectioning of the tooth may be needed in a to avoid a radical removal of mandibular bone or injury to other vital structures. Mandibular third molars frequently require sectioning of the tooth, but other teeth may also need to be sectioned to avoid fracture of the buccal alveolus. Okay, the tooth is delivered in pieces after it is sectioned. So what you need to do when you take out tooth in pieces is mainly irrigate the wound properly. And irrigation is important because suppose you have uh, this tooth is now broken into three, four pieces and then you take out and then you leave this small piece of tooth over there, then, you know, you never know what piece is left behind and then the um, site gets post extraction, the site gets healed, you will notice after some time that there is a little bit swelling. Okay, that is called a subperiosteal abscess, which is not a great thing because it's because of the presence of the fractured tooth or bone spicules below the soft tissue flap which had led to the abscess so be careful that you irrigate it well and take out all the pieces now replacement of the soft tissue flaps completes the procedure now what are the complications complications is you might end up injuring different um, Things. The tearing of the mucosal flap should be avoided by initially creating an appropriately sized incision. So first incision itself, you should be very careful while giving it. Any significant mucosal tear should be repaired at the end of the procedure. You can't just leave it. You have to make sure that you repair it. Puncture wounds in palate and tongue or other soft tissues are caused because of application of excessive and uncontrolled force to the instrument. So you have to be very careful. You have to use proper per amount of force and you should always have the proper control and suppose suppose you have injured any uh, area a little bit and um, like for example you have caused a tearing of the buccal mucosa make sure that you apply pressure to stop the bleeding and you have to make sure that it is healed and follow up with the patient Consideration should be given to antibiotic coverage depending upon the injury, like how severe or how mild and moderate it is. Now coming to oroantral communication. So what happens basically is suppose this is a maxillary uh, third molar, you have extracted it and due to some reason after extraction, you can see a hole opening. Like, you know, you can literally see through this part. That is nothing but the the communication between oral part and the antral part that is called as oroantral communications. And depending upon the severity, it can be managed with a figure of eight suture. And then by that, it will be closed and antibiotics and nasal spray, spray should be given uh, so that the infection can be prevented and keep the ostium open. Now coming to root fracture. So it is also a complication. So oroantral communications I have told you like you know if suppose you see that you just can't leave it because it has to be closed for example suppose imagine there is a passage right from your maxillary to nose so any irritation you try to uh, put anything water or anything you can feel a sensation in the nose so you you should advise the patient if you have seen such a condition not to cough sneeze you know heavily and this procedure has to be managed immediately now, tooth can be displaced. Like here, you can see um, maxillary molar root is in the maxillary sinus. Okay. And here you can see the maxillary third molar in the infratemporal fossa. Okay. And here you can see mandibular roots are forced into the submandibular space through buccal cortical bone. Here you can see that. And then tooth is lost in oropharynx. This is the tooth over here. This all may result in airway obstruction. Patient should be transported to emergency department for chest and abdominal radiographs. Or else how will you even know that tooth is there in your pharynx region, right? Because you might see like, I don't see it, but then I suspect it. Then you should send the patient definitely to get the radiographs done because the tooth can be displaced into maxillary sinus or intratemporal fossa or submandibular space or even the oropharynx region. Now, injury to the adjacent tooth. Here in the picture, you can see here, 
after extraction due to some reason, the lingual nerve is being cut. Here you can see the lingual nerve looks like this over here. So that can be because of, you know, fracture of teeth or restorations, luxation of adjacent teeth. Alveolar process fractures and fractures of maxillary tuberosity can occur when excessive force is used to remove the teeth. I have told you, it all happens when you use excessive force. So make sure that you are um, using minimal force. Okay. So again, luxation of the adjacent teeth mainly happens because of inappropriate use of extraction in instruments. So if you do not use it, you, for example, let me tell you something. Okay, you're extracting this tooth. So putting excessive pressure on this tooth means you might luxate this tooth. So this tooth is good, but you're causing damage to that. So that might be because of not using the instruments properly or using excessive force. So excessive force is always a bad thing. Make sure that you do not use excessive force. Okay. And um, trauma to inferior alveolar nerve may occur in the area of roots of mandibular third molars, causing numbness to the lower lip and chin. Okay, so if IAN is, uh, there is a trauma, definitely you can see that there is numbness to the lower lip and chin. And if lingual nerve is damaged, you can, uh, the tongue will be a little numb. Okay, you will lose the sensation and taste. So if patients are having this numbness for more than four weeks, they should be referred for micro neurosurgical evaluation. Okay. So what happens during the third molar removal is lingual nerve travels near the lingual cortex of the mandible. Okay. And uh, whenever an extraction is done, let me draw this diagram so that it will be easy for you. So this is the mandible, right? So suppose you're extracting mandible sec third molar. Make sure whatever we studied right now that Excessive force should not be used so that it doesn't affect the second molar. Okay. And, uh, you know, there are chances you can fracture the buccal cortex. And then you can see that uh, fractures of maxillary tuberosity also can be seen when you use excessive force. Okay. And um, this is the inferior alveolar nerve. So this is the inferior alveolar nerve. And... Um, I'm trying to draw. This is the mandibular canal. And this is the mental foramen. And here it gives off the branches. This is the mental nerve. And this is the incisive branches. Okay, so these are the different structures that might be affected. Okay, so you can cause damage to the adjacent teeth, you can cause damage to the alveolar process, you can damage the buccal cortex, you can damage the maxillary tuberosity, you can damage inferior alveolar nerve or even lingual nerve. Okay, so this was about injury to adjacent teeth. Now I'm going to do a quick recap. In oral antral communications, we studied that. Um, it can be managed with figure of eight suture. The root fracture is also a complication of extraction. Tooth displacement into the maxillary sinus, intratemporal fossa, submandibular space, and pharynx can happen. So always the patient has to be transported into emergency department straight away for the chest and abdominal radiographs. Now, another complication is using excessive force and injuring the other tissues like soft palate, tongue. Okay, and in case you use, make sure that it is healed soon. Now, tooth sectioning is another procedure where, you know, instead of causing more trauma or using excessive force, the tooth is removed in pieces. That is called tooth sectioning. And when you do that, make sure that you irrigate it properly so that there are no bony spicules or no tooth left behind, which may lead to subperiosteal abscess. Okay, and replacement of the soft tissue flaps completes the procedure. Okay, now coming to exposure. So first the doctor should have a good visibility of the surgical site and the flap should have adequate blood supply and usually envelope flaps are used but releasing incisions are common. 
okay and bone removal it is better to remove bone removal with a surgical burr rather than fracturing the entire cortex buccal cortex now coming to the classifications of uh, impacted tooth that are based on three kinds they are classified first so first is based on nature of overlying tissue they are classified into soft tissue impaction and hard tissue impaction soft tissue impaction you remove the soft tissue and then it's easy to extract it uh, hard tissue is partial and bony partial is where the height of the contour is below the bone level and complete bone impaction where the tooth is entirely encapsulated within the bone so complete bony impaction is hard to extract now coming to winter's classification winter's classification is based on the third molar a long axis in relation with the second molar so in vertical both are parallel mesial angular the third molar is tipped little mesially horizontal the second molar is perpendicular to the uh, long axis of the third molar distal angular it is tipped distally third molar and then that is the most difficult to extract buccolingual where the crown is facing buccal or lingual direction and inverted is other way around now Winter's classification is mainly for lower molars. Now coming to Pell and Gregory classification, they again have a subdivision of two types based on the Ramus relationships and based on the impaction depth. Based on Ramus relationships, it is classified into class one, class two, and class three. Class one, third molar is anterior to the Ramus. Class two, half is embedded. Class three, completely it's embedded. Now level A, B, and C, it is based on impaction depth. Okay, so here you can see all the molars are in the same occlusal plane. B, it is little deep, half, and then C is completely embedded. Now, surgical extractions and impactions. Impacted tooth is the one that fails to erupt into the dental arch. And uh, if we do not remove that, it remains for lifetime and it can cause problems with occlusion and cause unexplained pain so when there is unexplained pain is the when it is mostly weak and um, that is when patients come and then like you can see that it's a clear case of third molar impaction okay and then embedded is the word that can be used along with the term you know it can be other word for impacted now the most commonly impacted te teeth are mandibular third molars maxillary third molars and maxillary canines and congenital missing tooth are third molars and lateral incisors and mandibular premolars and different indications for extractions are caries, severe caries, severe periodontal conditions, ortho prescriptions, malpose teeth, frac teeth, pre prosthetic extractions for complete denture, impacted teeth, supernumerary teeth, and teeth associated with pathology. So, this was about today's class. In case you have liked the video, please do like, share, and subscribe, and leave a comment below and tell me like what are the things that you want me to include more. And if you need any specific notes, you can always reach out to me by leaving a comment below. And thanks for watching. And stay tuned to my channel.